welcome to the Financial Planners South Africa podcast, a show dedicated to driving the positive evolution of financial advice, specifically in South Africa. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. Portfolio Metrics is thrilled to bring you this podcast in support of our common passion for people and the evolution of wealth management. Our global business links precision investment management to expert financial advice through partnerships and technology. Visual, interactive, meaningful, productive. Four values underpinning Asset Map, a financial planning platform loved by advisors and their clients. This episode is proudly brought to you by Alan Gray. They say it's important to live for today. Although that might be true, we can't forget to plan for tomorrow. There's a lot of it left, after all. Alan Gray is an authorized financial services provider. Visit www.alangray.co.za to learn how we build long-term wealth for clients. Good afternoon, Dirk Grunefeld. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. You are well known in the industry to many, uh, someone that speaks their mind. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Thanks, Louis. Thanks for the invite. Um, I do speak my mind sometimes, but hopefully not to offend anybody. Yeah. So today's conversation, really, we want to unpack a little bit of your history, how you got into the industry, some of the interesting stories that you've shared with me, but also then focus on a little bit on your practice. You know, what's working, what have you tried to to implement and where you see the future. So if you don't mind just starting off for us and kind of giving us a little bit of a brief introduction to who Dirk is. Sure, Louis. Um, well, look, my journey started nearly 30 years ago um, <clears throat> as a, what was our 23 year old um, I had finished school, uh, done a marketing diploma, done my national service, been overseas, and I got back home and my dad told me I needed to get a job. So yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do. He introduced me to his uh, his advisor, his broker at that time, and the first company turned me down because of my age, and the next company employed me because the, uh, the branch manager went to the same school as myself. Uh, yeah, so I started off in a company called Southern Life, which has uh, eventually been taken over by Momentum. Um, and I started in the field division. In those days, we had, um, there were no computers. We had a rate book. So we were sent to Cape Town for two weeks on a course, learn how to do quotes uh, real time um, on the back of a cigarette box or on a, on a notepad. And um, and then we were sent out to sell in, you know, all kinds of setting techniques and closing techniques. Yeah, so that's where that's where I started. From there, um, after a few years, I left and was asked to join a um, a new business, which had been started by uh, an individual who had started who had run a very successfully uh, for financial planning, well, not financial planning, a broking business, and sold to a corporate. Um, he was starting something new. Unfortunately, after about three months, I worked out that the the ethics, the way of doing business wasn't quite what appealed to me. So I had to leave and go on my own. And I was very fortunate then that a friend I'd worked with at Southern Life uh, had joined another corporate and asked me to join to run their financial planning division, which I then did. Yeah, so I was into corporate. And then about 20, 20, now, yeah, what, 2000, 2001, we had the um, the rand was um, taking a hell of a, a whack against your your harder currencies. Uh, we had the IT boom, which those then simultaneously almost collapsed. And it was up until then, well, just at that time that I realised that as much I was trying to add value to clients, I really I was I was not. I was simply a, an intermediary pushing product for the uh, big asset managers and life companies, and um, and I really, yeah, I felt worthless, and I and I was I considered leaving the industry. Nothing against used car salesmen, but I, I deem that as being a, a far more honourable practice than I was involved in. Uh, and then I was very fortunate that I heard about a business called IPAC, which had been brought to South Africa by from Australia by Andrew Bradley, 
Um, and uh, yeah, I flew to Cape Town, met with him, told him what my issues were, and he showed me what they were about, which was a concept, a new concept called lifestyle financial planning. Um, it absolutely fitted what I was missing, uh, and I flew back to Port Elizabeth the next day, and and that was it. One of the big changes was I had to move from commission to fees, and I did that immediately. Um, so that was that was quite an adjustment. Uh, I had to make a lot of personal changes in my in my living standards, let's say, uh, the vehicles I drove, the houses I lived in, and I had to do all of that, which which I then did. Um, I then, um, a few years later, then actually opened my own business and uh, client care, which has now been running for going on 20 years now. Um, I fully embraced lifestyle financial planning. Um, yeah, and I suppose the rest is history. Oh, brilliant. That really is a journey. Can we spend a bit of time defining lifestyle financial planning? To a lot of people listening to this, they might think, oh, but you know, I do lifestyle financial planning because I ask my clients what is important to them. How do you define, and more particularly, how do you explain lifestyle financing, lifestyle financial planning to your clients? Well, Louis, to be honest, I think it's morphed, and uh, you know, it's one of these things that I think we we keep need to get better at, and when we never get there. You know, initially, what was brilliant is that there was a there was a model. You know, there was a tool we could use. Um, we didn't have to be fan pickers anymore. There were um, there were funds which were inflationary targeted. The first ones in South Africa, in fact, which is just about 21 years ago, 22 years ago. So, so initially, it was about being able to basically do cash flow planning as we know it today in a very, very basic sense. But then, as we got into it, it became more and more about the conversations. And I honestly believe that that's what it is today. You know, the whole industry is revolves, I think, internationally around asset management. And at the end of the day, it comes down to that. That's how most of us get paid. That's uh, why the companies do what they do. But it really is more about um, how I would explain it to a client is that we focus on you and not your money. Your money is important, but only to the extent that, you know, we help you build an investment strategy that talks back to the kind of life that you would like to live into the future and presently. So it really is, you know, a lot of people use the word client focused, but it, it really is on in, in another way. And it, it is also, it, it is helping clients make their own decisions. So it's not about having the solution for the client. It's about helping the client arrive at the solution on their own, because that is really the only way that they're going to um, change their behavior um, and, and then achieve ultimately what they would like. Yeah, I would imagine that you have a much higher buy-in from your clients. You know, if if you guide them through this decision-making process that that you talk about. Yeah, we do because I think you know the the industry has um, forever and still does. You know, it, it it chooses to keep the the general public confused because it 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 suits them and people don't ask too many questions. And I think when you know part of our job is to simplify the all the the financial terms and what it means and, and help clients understand that they, you know, their power is, is really in the choices that they make both now and into the future and to understand that they actually have control where I think a lot of in the past, the industries said, just leave it to us and we'll do it for you. Um, so yes, it definitely, it definitely um, allows clients to feel empowered um, and, and that in turn, I think gives them a lot of freedom. Yeah, great. Are you able to share a little bit of the onboarding process that you would take a new client through? Because oftentimes it sounds like, well, this lifestyle financial planning is a lot more work than just, you know, building a, a an investment portfolio for a client. Yeah, I think it's, it, it is a lot more work and it's a, it's completely different. Um, yeah, so, you know, just on the investment side, we have, we have, partnered with the uh, asset management team that do that for us for the last 20 years. And, and you know, they've just got inflation plus targets, which they do achieve over the long run. So that then talks back to the plan. But yeah, so we have a, we built a, a three meeting process that we take clients through. Most of the clients that come to us have been referred by existing clients. Um, and the first meeting is really just a coffee chat where we get to know a little bit about them and why they're here, why they're not happy with who they're currently with or or, or you know the problems that they're issues that they're having, um, and and really what we what we 
uh, provide them with is the opportunity to then enter our process. So in our first meeting, a lot of it is really just finding out about who they are individually or as a couple or as a family, you know, what's unique about them, you know, what are their motivators, um, just really. So a lot of history, finding out a lot about their past, you know, we, I believe it's important to understand how someone has got to where they are to understand who they are. And, uh, and very often we find we ask them questions and, and they, it's, it's things that they haven't thought of for many, many years. But it, it has helped, uh, you know, format the way that they think about their finances or, or about life in general. So we, we, we do a bit of that. And then we also take them through our process um, where we talk about you now the, the three hats of lifestyle financial planning, which we like to use, which Paul Armson um, very kindly showed me. Yeah, and, and the different roles that we play, you know, in, in life planning, financial planning, and then financial advice. And we, we, we build the expectation on what working with us will be like, what, the, what the, the actual practical part will be, how often we would meet, how we would meet, what we would discuss in those meetings. And most of it is not about funds or money. And we, yeah, that's generally about an hour. And then in our, in our, you know, if after that they're happy with, with what they've heard and we also comfortable that we would, be able to add value to them. At this point, we very mostly we have no idea of the of the financial status of the of the couple. Um, you know, we purposely don't ask them to bring any information to that meeting because we just find that you know if you're looking at the money, it's very it, it, as human as we are, it's difficult to look at the person separately. So if they're happy with that, then we will send them a welcome letter that evening and then start dropping off. You know information bits that they need to then collect and, and get back to us in the second meeting we have what we call is our goal setting meeting um, we do a little bit more exploring into the the personal side in other words you know um, how do they feel about money what's important about money for them um, about their, their, their family important people in their lives about how they feel about retirement how they see retirement uh, and then obviously you know the general very general goal setting which which i'm starting to realize is more kind of yeah is is it, that stuff's always going to change and it's not really as important you know how often i replace my car or go on holiday uh it, they are they are important factors but it's not really as important as the the deeper goals or ambitions that that a person or a couple would have uh by this time normally we've collected most of the information um, and then what we do is we so you can hear we kind of following the six step uh, financial planning process as per the, the financial planning institute and then we obviously sit and do a little bit of maths um, and then we would sit with them and, and show them a snapshot of where they are at that point we'll also do a bit of um, education on on markets so we just talk about very basic principles about the need to beat inflation um, you know the the need to uh, to have to be exposed to risk. Uh, you know the uh, how markets work. You know short term, long term, but very very basic principles um, that that help them understand. You know why keeping their money in cash is probably not a good idea in the long run. Um, and then we then we show them where they are, and then after that we've highlighted certain issues which we believe are important, um, and this again, would be fairly general stuff or we would get clarity on certain things that we had picked up. And um, yeah, and then we go into discussion from that and that that meeting can last a while. Um, and then obviously, you know, you get clients with different complexities. And based on that, you know, after that meeting, we would then go back and do a bit more work or they would do a bit more work and get us more information. And then we would do more work. And we'd, we'd really just carry on with that process until... Uh, you know, we, we, we've we achieved everything that they need. So very often there's a list of things that need to be done, you know, things like updating wills, checking trusts, uh, businesses, structures, and partnership agreements, all those kinds of things. So very often that, that on, ongoing process can actually take us months a lot of the time. But, you know, the belief is that the more time we spend with our clients, the more we can build a relationship, the more trust we can build, and the more value we can add. Sure, it really sounds like you've nailed down that process over the last couple of years. What's been one of the resources that have helped you think about structuring lifestyle financial planning? Or is, or is this just something that you've managed to create? 
I think it's I think it's from different sources. You know, when um, when you know IPAC became Axis and was then bought by Old Mutual, who started Old Mutual Wealth. So there there, there were there, there was a process that they had put in place, which which is pretty similar. Obviously, what we've done is we've enhanced it and uh, we've personalised it more. You know, I. Um, I, I talk to a lot of people around the world. I, I read a lot, um, and uh, I, yeah, I get quite quite snoopy. And I've I've met, you know, people like like Paul and Mitch and uh, Brett Davidson, and the yeah, the list the list goes on. Um, just to find out and learn more from all of these people, people like yourself as well, obviously. And then and then obviously a lot of a lot of our. Um, you know, uh, we call them strategic partners. You know, the whole uh, the whole IPAC and and Access community uh, was has been fantastic in building building community. You know, the best place to learn is from other financial planners. Um, and you know, we built a community that is full of sharing and helping each other and and all of that. So so I think you you know um, we all eventually build something which makes sense to us. Um, and you start you put it together. And it's a bit rigid, and you work through it. But as you do it more and more, you, it becomes more your own. You own it. You, we constantly upgrade and up and change things. Um, and then we also, as we learn, we get more experience. We're able to tweak it for certain clients. We we can sense that certain clients, you know, maybe need a different approach to others. But we 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 do not work with anyone if they are not prepared to go through through that process. And we've simply found out that if we do try and shortcut it, we get problems later on. I think your the name of your practice, Client Cares, sums it up so nicely, you know, and it's come through a couple of times that you say, well, we really care about our clients. And it shows up by you taking the time to research things globally and saying, okay, how do we deliver the best possible financial planning and lifestyle financial planning experience to our clients? When you constructed your team in terms of the business, like how do you select people and, and how did that happen? Yeah, I got lucky. Um, I got unlucky first. Um, you know, over the years, I've been in one or two attempted partnerships, and and, and they haven't really worked. Uh, looking back, really, just because of, I suppose, different personalities, different outlooks, and different. I don't want to say values, but maybe vision. Vision, and um, I, I've just been very careful in when we choose people to work with us. I look more to the quality of the person and the values that that person has. Um, obviously, it depends on the work they're going to be doing in the business. But you know, I've, I've found that if people with the right attitude and that caring attitude, you know, they what do they call it, the care gene or whatever, um, you know, those people can learn anything because you know if they work in an environment where they feel um, that they're part of a team and they feel that they're adding value. Um, then they, they're naturally going to be doing that. So, um, you know, we, we have had to choose people who have qualifications, you know, to full financial planning roles. Um, so we, we have done that. We are doing that. We also, we the business is paying to educate uh, existing staff who came in as a, a receptionist to become a financial planner. So, you know, we make sure everyone within the business has their own career path if they want. In fact, we do want them to have a career path to personal growth is important. Um, but yeah, I think in, in short, just choosing the, the people with the right values and similar values, um, that doesn't mean the same strengths, different strengths, but similar values is really important um, because it, it does come through in in how the clients feel when they, with, when they deal with anybody in the business. Yeah, Seth Godin talks about Hire for attitude and train for skill. If you've got someone with the right attitude and the right vision, I guess that would also help you think about succession planning. You know, what are the who are the people that you'd feel comfortable leaving part of your business to? Yeah, most certainly. I mean, you know, I think it's something that you know when you start off in this industry, as I said, selling policies, and uh, to where we where we are now is 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 a it's a completely different situation. And um, again, you know, rightly or wrongly, a lot of people traditionally in this business look to build a book and then sell it for a multiple. I I battle with that concept. I just I I don't understand how we can sell a relationship, but it does happen. Yeah. So what we're doing having having identified a couple of uh, individuals who who have very similar values. 
want the same sort of thing long term, um, have have patience, um, want to make a difference out there. Uh, the only way to really do that, to be honest, is for you know I've got to give and they've got to give. So I've got to we, we're entering a process now where we will be selling in inverted commas shares to younger planners in the business to allow them to get skin in the game. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily have the funding, so we assisting with that. Uh, but the idea is that in the long run, instead of having 100% of a pie, we're going to have a percentage of a much, much bigger pie. Um, you know, the, the one side is, is, is making as much money as we can, and I think most people will have learned that that doesn't bring happiness. But being part of something that is meaningful, you know, that's that's – for me and and I think the people we have in the business that really makes makes life worth living. So so that's the path that we chosen and um, and that we we're working towards. We you know we don't have all the answers as to how to work, but uh, certainly bringing in caring individuals and and the goal is to build something which is bigger than ourselves and that continues. It it'll never be. No one's going to sell the business one day. I can see how important these relationships, not only with your clients, but also with your team members are. Are there any client stories that stand out in your mind over looking back over your career so far? Anything that's that's memorable that you feel comfortable sharing with us? Louis, there are two. The, the, the one is uh, on both ends of the scale. Let's talk about wealth. So, you know, we had this client I had for years. And he was a he was a little trader, and he traded on his own, and he would sell to supermarkets, and you know, put his children through varsity and and everything. And he just worked and worked and worked, and he was getting to an age where his health was really t- t- starting to take strain. Um, and as much as I would advise them to kind of cut the purse strings to some of the children, they they just couldn't do it. And uh, and eventually one day they walked in and he looked an absolute mess. And I just said to him, you've got to stop this now. And his wife was with him. And I said, you have to stop this now. You have to make changes. Otherwise, in a year's time, you're going to be dead and your wife's going to be on her own. And she looked at him and he looked at her and that was, she just nodded and said, that's exactly what's going to happen. And he said, yeah, okay, that's fine. But how do I do it? So eventually what we had to do is we, they had a son who was living with them. And not contributing, although he had a decent, decent job. So eventually, we had to sell their house, move them into a retirement village, so that the son had to find his own way, uh, and then restructure, close down his business, uh, and restructure everything so that they were then able to retire and to actually live. And and it's been it, it's been tight for them, and there've there've been things that they haven't been able to do. Um, but it was actually wonderful. He he sent me a message last week or the week before. Just he was obviously in a reflective mood. They were spending time with their granddaughter, and yeah, he just sent us a message thanking us for the role that we had played um, in his life and and what it meant. And he, he's just got a very different way of uh, expressing himself. And when I look at that, I mean that's all he talks about. Um, so, so you know, making a difference like that, which was potentially very risky, but I think in the end, you, you kind of you got to go with your gut and your heart, and you've you've got to give someone the courage to make that change. So that's that's a very special story to us. And then we have had another client on the other end of the scale who came referred to us by their children uh, in their early seventies, more than enough well off, but who grew up in the war, and as many of us would know, who had parents. Who grew up in the war, you know, were extremely conservative, lived very, very frugally, had more money than they could ever spend, uh, but struggled to spend it. You know, literally wouldn't go out and have a cappuccino because they felt it was overpriced. And and unfortunately, the planner that they'd been with since their retirement was very much in the old dinosaur kind of framework where you would send them a report once a week and see or once a year and see them once a year and just basically say, well, it's up or it's down or whatever. And, um, you know, we took them through our process, which which was difficult because, you know, when you take someone in their 70s and you're asking them questions like, you know, you know, how was money growing up and, you know, these kinds of things. That, but anyway, they, they participated fantastically and it went really well. 
and he was an engineer, which makes it even more difficult because he's obviously quite analytical. I think three years we've been working with them now. After 18 months, they took their whole family, five kids on holiday to the UK, flew a grandson in from the, U, from the US, spent two or three weeks together, did overseas trips until COVID hit. They have just, uh, I mean, recently they are uh, helping a, a one child in the UK with a serious acquisition because of a health issue. They are doing things that they would never, ever have done before never ever done before and you know ultimately they would have eventually passed away and their children would have had a some of them would have had quite a lot of hardship and they they wouldn't have been able to have those times together so you know and um what what you know when i when i when they decided to work with me you know when i actually showed them the modeling and i showed them that actually if they moved all their money into cash they would never run out of money. She she got very emotional and shed a tear. And I'm not sure if it was anger or out of anger or out of relief. And, and 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 I said to her, so you know, why what is the reason? She said, Well, the last time they were with the advisor, as they were leaving, she turned to him and said, Are we gonna be okay? And he looked at her and he said, You should be. And she said she didn't sleep for a week. So having certainty to know that not only was she going to be okay, but she could start changing her outlook on life and start spending, you know, more quality time with the family and loved ones. Um, again, there we've, I can see that we've really affected a change in, in their lives. And yeah, that's what we are to do. Wow. Thank you for sharing those stories with us. Derek. It, you know, you, you're actually bringing meaning to your clients lives through helping them actually be able to enjoy their money and enjoy it with with the people that are important to them. Uh, so I, I almost feel like you know lifestyle financial planning d- doesn't it doesn't sound like it would even encapsulate that, um, but it's just a, a byproduct of what you do. Yeah, I think the job is to spend as much money as you can, you know. And and the the problem that a lot of people who've built up wealth over a long period is that very often it's because they've saved really hard and conscientiously. And, and they feel guilty when it comes to spending money and having a good time. And, you know, quite differently to, let's say, your older type advisors, we, we don't look to accumulate funds. Obviously, we do as we, as we gain clients under management or whatever you want to call it. But what we look at, we look at is how can we get clients to spend their money? Um, and that's a lot of fun. That is a lot of fun. But uh, that's very rewarding as well. Can we maybe delve into that a little bit? Because... You know, imagine there's a client coming to you that's getting to retirement, that's built up a wealth of money over the last 65 years. How do you get them to change from accumulating to being able to spend that money guilt-free? Like, What are the things that you would do in your business? Look, Louis, there's some that we just, we don't manage to do it, you know, but that's fine. Yeah, I, I think giving them, you know, obviously with, with all the planning that we do, we always are on the conservative side. You know, as much as we plan, life happens. And, you know, and, and as we get older, you know, those can be negative things as well. So, you know, which which could obviously mean incurring costs. So we, we try and plan for all of those and, and make allowances for all of those in our planning. But I think, again, spending more time with clients, you know, if they hear the same thing over and over again, then eventually they, they will eventually start to believe it. And, and, you know, in our, in our um, goal setting, in our exploratory meetings, you know, finding out what it, what it is that they want to do. What did they want to do when they were 18 years old? You know, what, you know, when they were 25, when they first got married, you know, what were those things that they wanted? And then they'll come up with things, oh, we forgot about this completely. You know, and very often, and very often what happens is things that they really, really want to do, once they start doing it, they find out actually it's not what they want to do is something completely different. So this goal setting thing, and as I said, goal setting, I think you've got to find another word for that. It's, it's maybe life, I don't know, life experiences, I don't know. But I think it, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. You know, when, when we do a review, you can't just sit and do a review and say, well, you know, what happened over the last year and what are your plans and how did the money do? I think it's, you know, you've got to revisit every year and say what's changed. You know, what has changed about obviously in your life, but then also about the way you feel about certain things, you know, um, and when people retire, the best years they have are those immediate years when they stop work. Uh, when we're talking about health, we're talking about their ability to travel and be active and do things. So, you know, it, it's very, all very well planning. 
<clears throat> for someone to the age of 105, you know, and obviously it's important to do that, but not at the cost of not living in the present. So obviously finding that balance is, is important. Yeah, I think so many times financial plans tend to be super conservative. And then the only thing that ends up is, you know, their legacy or the inheritance just is that much more. But someone missed out on the, what they term the go-go years, right? So you have the energy you are able to spend. And it almost ties into, you know, the George Kinder life planning questions where they start off saying, well, if money wasn't a, wasn't a constraint, what would you do with your time? How would you spend money? And then from there, limited to say, well, if you only had 10 years left to live, what would you do with your time? And then the third one really gets to the crux where they're limited to say, well, you go to the doctor and you find out you only have 24 hours to live. Not what do you do, but what did you miss out on? Who did you not get to be? What did you not get to experience? And I can only imagine that these kind of things come up as you spend time with your clients discussing what's important to them. No, they do. And, and, and again, certain clients get to that point a lot easier than others. And obviously, depending on the relationship we have with them, we, we can build a quicker rapport with certain people. But again, that's why we, you know, we would rather choose to meet more often with our clients. You know, so we have, we have a fixed six monthly, you know, the one meetings a catch up and the other ones a full review of, of their financial plan and financial lifestyle plan and situation. But we also encourage contact you know in between if anything happens yeah and and we also found that the more that people are actually doing these reaching these dreams in their lifestyle and their goals as they start living more of that life they start looking for more you know you know i think you know moving from a working life to a retired life we know can be very stressful for clients so we also spend a lot of time before they retire educating them on what does it actually look like you know what is it you know, trying to get visualized what a day is going to look like in retirement. Yeah, these upcoming transitions, you know, what can you, what can you pre- prepare for? No, certainly. The, the one thing that comes to mind is obviously advisor remuneration, because a lot of the things that you mentioned is, you know, we're not gathering assets. We can only work with so many people. Uh, the money is less important. How do you balance remuneration? What does the structure look like? I know it's something that... You know, you've thought about quite a lot and yeah, I'd just love to hear your thoughts around advisory remuneration. Yeah, Louis, so I mean obviously initially moving from commission to fees was was really hard. It was very, very tough and as I said, you know, huge hugely added downscale lifestyle. Um I got divorced around that time as well. So it, it was it, it wasn't an easy time, but at the same time it wasn't a difficult time because I had uh, I knew that what we were onto was something far more valuable in the long run. So there was that change. Um, so that the assets under management, the AEM model, was a far fairer way of working. But as I'm getting into it more and more, and I'm also realizing it's not the ideal way to work because it doesn't really speak. You know, if you look at the the three hat scenario that Paul Armson created with life planner, financial planner, and financial advisor, we're getting played on the financial advisor side. Whereas really where we add the least value, and sorry, you know, we, do you just mind defining those those three? Like, what are the differences between them? Yeah, so the the first hat and the most important is helping clients with their life planning, and that doesn't mean that we are a life planner. It simply means helping clients uncover what is important for them in their life and what they want to do. So it's like I say to you, you know, the goals of. Uh, buying a car every five years and going on holiday once a year. Those are very, very simplified things. But life planning, we don't do life planning, but helping them with their life planning is, is helping them uncover their values, what is important to them, and if they travel, why they would want to travel, and where they would rent, and why there, and what do they want to do with their kids or their grandkids, and why is that important? You know, So it really is that. And then the financial planning hat deals more with the – the, the, the mathematics of the situation, you know, you've got X, Y, you're spending, you've got X, you're spending Y, how must the money be invested to make sure that, you you know, it, it doesn't run out before you run out. So so it's really the cash flow planning and all of that. And then the financial advice is, is simply what vehicles do we use? So do we use, you know, retirement funds or, or shares or unit trusts? Um, and then what funds do we use? Those kinds of things. Okay, so the product implementation 
part. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and the and the the irony is that we get paid on the advent on the financial advisor side, whereas we add far more value on the other two. So we 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 use a asset under management. Uh, fee scale at the moment, and we scale it down because I do believe the you know the um, the notion that if you're charging one percent on ten million rand and you obviously earning what you do on that, and you would charge one percent on fifty million rand, that you're adding more value. I mean, I think most people will understand that that, that just doesn't add up. So. It, it's, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying for my mind, it needs to be looked at. Obviously, the industry works has always worked where the clients who don't pay you enough and the clients who pay you too much is that cross-subsidization. I believe the universe works like that to a certain extent, so it's not the end of the world. But I do think there's a limit probably to the amount of value that we can add. And the bigger thing is I think there are too many advisors and over time, the majority of our big advisors and you know the successful ones are the ones who've sold the most, who have added nowhere near value to the amount that they've earned and currently still continue to earn. So I think there's a huge disparity there. We've got people paying fees and they're seeing an advisor once a year. You know, the portfolios have never been reviewed. Uh, we got a new client referred to us by actually these other clients. She's never been asked to do a budget. Now, I'm not sure how you can drop a financial plan if there isn't a budget. Um, in this case, there is no financial plan. There's money. Um, so, you know, the, this, this person's been getting absolutely no value, but they've been paying a handsome price for this. And, and they've, they've never questioned it because the industry kind of portrays this as a norm. So personally, um, we looking, and I've, I've chatted to Alan Smith in London from Capital a lot on this. I know he's doing a talk uh, on the 20th of May, which we're definitely going to be watching um, about values-based pricing. I'm not sure how it works. That's why we're talking to him. But I, I just think, and again, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying I believe there's a better way and a fairer way of doing it. And I think the there are a lot of... Um, medium to wealthy clients who are paying way more than they need to be paying. You, you know, a lot of situations are very, very simple. If you've got a single person with one retirement fund versus a, a couple with a couple of trusts and kids and grandkids and, and different business structures, you know, something like that obviously takes a lot more work, a lot more skill um, and should be priced differently to, to the simple scenario. Um, and, and in there, I think, lies massive opportunity. You know, one of the biggest barriers to entry in the industry, I think, around the world for youngsters is that they're typically the people they're going to deal with um, don't have money because they're saving. They, 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 millennials or, as well, or Gen Ys, I think, is a new one now. I'm not sure. And, um, you know, so it's very difficult for them. So I think these kind of fee models uh, will, will help sort that industry out. And I know people talk about the advice gap. <laughs> I laugh because they're worried about all the people who can't afford to pay for advice. I see it differently. I think of all the people who are paying 10 times more than they should for getting absolutely zero advice. So I think there's enough to go around for everyone. And, and I do believe that in the next five years, even in South Africa, that there's going to be a large, a large change on, on that side of the industry. Yeah, that makes so much sense. You know, being able to work with people that might be rich in terms of income but haven't accumulated assets by changing your your mechanism of pricing you now can serve those clients so it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to clients that have accumulated specifically investable assets right what about the clients that have large property portfolios I guess it's just rethinking the way we've always done things. And, there, and there's a bit of a theme, you know, I can see throughout your history saying, hey, this this model is broken. We need to rethink yeah. that. Um, what else is there that kind of you think is broken in the financial services world that uh, that we should be paying closer attention to? I think the industry is still driven very much by your big, big companies, your life companies, your asset management companies. And unfortunately, I, th I think the problem, you know, we, we obviously deal with a few of those. And, and I can tell you that the quality of person at a high level is is way, way superior to what it was 10 years ago. And I'm, I'm not 
I'm not saying across the board. I'm just saying generally the on how approachable they are, how open they are to a new way of thinking and trying to actually maneuver those 150 plus year businesses on a, into a, a different different C. And unfortunately, I don't think the change is going to come from them because, you know, their, their, their bosses, their gods are shareholders and, um, you know, perhaps CEOs who get appointed on a short term contract uh, and remunerate according to that, which, which flies in the face of what the people out there actually need. And, you know, I've got mates who run asset management businesses and I joke with them, I say, we do all the work and you make all the money. Um, and I think that needs to change. You know, again, the fact that you've got a fund that might hold a billion rand and, you know, they're charging one and a half percent asset management fee. And then it's one day it's got two billion and they're still charging the same. Again, just does not make sense in, in, in any other industry. You know, when you're buying in bulk, you get a discount. Um, and again, if you see how many of those companies are actually outperforming indices, um, I think I think South African markets in for a big, big, a big wake up here. Um, and I think there's a there's an opportunity for the first big player to live with a few unhappy shareholders for a while, but build a long term business model that's sustainable. Because I think eventually, when it does give, and it will, it's not that it won't, it will, because it's happened, it's happened in the states, it's happened all over the world in the UK. You know, they call it, you know, whether you call it passes or, or evidence based investing. Um, the fact is, is that the the proof is in the evidence. And you know, to be to be paying huge fees for very little value just simply doesn't make sense. And and in a world where the more we can cut our expenses, you know, the better long term outcomes we're gonna get. That that's certainly gonna happen. And 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 the public out there are getting smarter and sharper. You know, when you've got businessmen who've who've been successful because they've paid attention to the bottom line and to expenses and where are they getting value or where they're not getting value. It's only a matter of time before they start following blindly and, uh, you know, the piper, and they start asking a few questions. And I'm, I'm seeing it more and more. Um, and, yeah, I think I think there's a huge opportunity for one of the big players because they have the science to be able to do this, but I'm, I'm not really seeing any willingness at the moment. So am I correct Dirk, that you're actually kind of embracing that cost discussion with your client and saying, yeah, let's figure out a way to bring down the total cost as opposed to, you know, seeing cost reduction as a threat to the advisor? So, so for instance, with the asset managers we've worked with, it's always, it's based on the final outcome. So it's based on the outcome after costs. So even in our cash flow modeling, we build in whatever fees they are, the asset management fee, our fee, admin fees, all of that, it's built in. So for me, you know, it's not that no one's allowed to make any money. Of course, you know, everyone needs to feed their families. And if you work really hard, then do really well, that's fine. But where, you know, cost is cost is only an issue in the, in the lack of, you know, where, where there is no value. And, and what I'm saying is that clients would be able to achieve certain outcomes a lot easier if certain expenses were maybe more in line with the value that they brought. Yeah, so I think there's there's a huge margin, there's a huge, huge margin there, and it's going to happen. So, you know, we don't, our, our clients are aware of our costs and whatever costs they're incurring, you know, in one of the first meet, in the first meeting, we we run through the asset management fee, the um, the admin fee and our fee. Um, on every uh, on every um, review, we, we run through that as well. We've, in fact, recently a few clients we've sent them documents to reduce their fees because we have a sliding scale. So because markets have done nicely over the short while, uh, you know, we probably look at it every two years or so. So they're actually getting a reduction in their costs, which is which is quite nice. Uh, and 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 fast, they're still a, a hugely profitable clients. So I know this is very contentious. And I know, especially in South Africa, people are saying it won't happen, it won't happen. It's going to happen. It is going to happen. And there are many, many dinosaurs out there who have who have done incredibly well personally, financially. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that, you know, times are changing and that, that spread could be spread through over a lot more people. And a lot of clients can achieve their outcomes um, a lot easier without having to pay all these costs over, over their lifetime. Mm, I guess it's one of the few things that you can control. And we've seen that, you know, just looking at 
the probability of success, how that increases if someone's fees drop. I want to talk a little bit about the people that you're mentoring. Um, I know there's a group of youngsters or young advisors, um, even Tapiso, who's your ASISA <coughs> graduate, if I understood that correctly. Um, yeah. How do you see this? How do you see their role in the industry? And also, what are you sharing with them to keep them motivated? Because it can be super lonely and it, uh, it's really a tough industry to start out with. Yeah, so Louis, for me, the, the biggest, you know, you know, when I first started to work with IPAC and then Axis, you know, and, and it, I started off very, very slowly. It, it was it was a personally a very tough time for me. And um, I really wasn't able to focus too much on the business because my family took priority. And what I'll never forget is the people in that business, IPAC and Axis, and then the other strategic partners. Um, the way I was treated was was as an absolute equal. Yeah, and uh, it, it's quite emotional for me because you know they um, helped me along and, and and kept me going and and made me feel that I was relevant. Which and, and it was a tough time. So yeah, now the shoe's kind of on the other foot, and we I've built a half decent business, and um, I think it just started off. I met I met one of my daughter's mates at a bry, and he was a young planner, just moved to PE, and he had kind of heard about this concept, but didn't really know. But he's a really good chap. And then there are a couple of other youngsters that I chatted to on LinkedIn, and they ask for advice now and then. So what I did is I just started, and I had a, a Alex who had started with me. So I just started a, a young group where the guys would come in once every five or six weeks. And we would, you know, because people don't know what they don't know. So we talk about lifestyle planning and people think, oh, well, it's a model. It's not a model. So, you know, we would, you know, I would I would share stuff that I'd learned over time and like like Paul's three hats or stuff, you know, from, from Mitch, Anthony as well and, and other people. And uh, yeah, so it was just a safe place for them to ask questions, to learn. Um, I took them all through my process. So the process that I've taken years building, I basically gave them all of the slides, everything. I said, well, you're going to have to change it because it's got client key logo on it. But, um, you know, and, and build, build your own process, you know, something that works for you. But, you know, this is a, this is a good way to start. So we started doing that, and um, and then obviously the group grew slowly as, you know, they told some mates about it. And then, um, and then COVID hit, and then we moved online, uh, and then uh, yeah, then we started getting, you know, people all around the country. So it, it's not a huge group. I think there are about seventeen or eighteen of us um, in the group currently. Yeah, and we take an hour and a half once a month. Uh, at the moment, we've just got everyone sharing their onboarding process. Um, you know how they how they take clients through, and and, and it's really interesting. And as I said, it's just a safe place for people to ask questions, um, to to not feel intimidated, uh, that, you know, that they might sound silly, and and to discuss certain things. So we we, we try and stay away from like the fee discussion because that that'll go on forever. We don't talk about asset management because that's not lifestyle planning. It's a part of it, but it's it's not the most important part. Um, yeah, and 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 it's just to, you know, there were people that helped me. So I think I think giving back is is really really important. You know, I personal, I personally have a personal mission, or a just cause, as Simon Sinek would call it. You know, um, to have a, a a living lifestyle financial plan in every home in South Africa, and and the there's only there's three ways. There's, we can't we can't do that on our own. So you know, this is also part of the decision to to grow the business and with personnel is to try and spread the message more. But we can do that three ways. Firstly, by helping youngsters in the business to become better planners, better lifestyle planners, you know, by by educating the public, which is something that we we need to be doing more because most people out there don't understand that this is not that it, this is a different thing. They think they've got it because uh, their brokers tell them that they're doing it. And then also, you know, through our own clients, you know, obviously by by getting our clients to embrace this, they, they are able then to spread the word and tell, you know, their friends and family about it. Um, so for me, yeah, that's quite a personal mission. And this is this is one way of doing it by just kind of spreading the love and, you know, getting more people who, who become disciples of lifestyle financial planning out there. That is a really admirable mission. Can you repeat that again for us? A living lifestyle financial plan in every household in South Africa? Yeah, well, you know, if 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 everyone, regardless of their financial station, 
went through a process because part of this is education as well, obviously. I just understood that everything they do is a financial decision. It has an effect now and especially into the future. So, you know, they, they just, people don't, people don't drive themselves to a negative financial position on purpose. They, they do it because, you know, they've got no one telling them that it might be the wrong thing to do. So, you know, we need to help, we need to help people with their conscience and we, and we can do that through education and through um, coaching and, and assisting and just being a, you know, they call it a trusted advisor, just being a part of their life. You know, that if they, they can pick up the pick up the phone and call us quickly and, and ask us what about this or what about that. And we get that. You know, we get people don't buy vehicles without getting old and say, well, you know, um, it's time. Should we do it or shouldn't we do it? And then we have the discussion about what's going on in your life and do you need it and how do you feel about it and all of that. So, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if you know, the biggest problem in, in this country is the the huge inequality that there is. And the only way that we can do that, you know, we're dealing with with the vast majority in this country who have not had exposure to financial planning. And if they have, it's been the wrong kind of financial planning. It's been policy salesmen who have ripped them off because those people need to survive themselves. And they've got targets and branch managers and regional managers and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it hasn't done hasn't done anyone any good. So, you know, if we're slowly able to, to eke away and to educate more people and and, and that's what I'm saying. You know, the, if you look at the amount of fee that gets earned in the industry and it's being enjoyed by so few, you know, never have so few earned so much and added so little value. If we could just change that to, you know, um, and again, it's nothing wrong with being financially successful. But I just think there's a huge disparity between between that and that needs to change. And if we do that, you know, if, if we get the average South African's wealth to, to increase, you know, um, tenfold over over a few generations it will change the, the you know the outlook for the country completely if that's not the positive evolution of financial advice i i don't know what is uh, and thanks for for the massive role that you play in you know moving this industry into <clears throat> a profession so that we can actually get to make a bigger impact in our clients lives that part that you mentioned you know your clients phone you when they have to make a decision on which car to buy it makes me think that we can think about client requests one or two ways. It can either be, oh, this client's asking for something again and it can be a burden or it could be what we're trying to do is working. Our clients are reaching out to us because we help them to make better decisions. They feel more confident after they've had that discussion and they have more clarity and more purpose. You know, what more can any profession give? Uh, I can't imagine of anything else. Yeah, because, you know, the answer isn't always, yes, you can afford it. You know, it's, well, yes, you can afford it, but what else could you do with that money? And what would that mean to you? And how would that change another aspect in your life? I think our, our job is, you know, we, we came in as, as experts, you know, selling financial concepts and policies and investments. And, you know, then, you know, we all, we got our CFP and we became qualified and we knew a bit more and, you know, then we became really good at problem solving. Um, but I think where the future lies is is helping clients solve their own problems. You know, we simply, we help give them the tools to come up with the answers themselves. Because we all know that if you come up with the answer yourself, it becomes ingrained in you and you, and you will truly follow through and you will do that. As opposed to, so, you know, someone standing behind you with a whip and saying, come on, do it, come on, let's do it, you know. So... I think that's really where the future lies is, is with empowering people. And, you know, if people are thinking that way, then there's a good chance that they're going to educate their kids to a similar mindset. Um, and again, that just then contributes to the, the betterment of, of society. Brilliant. Uh, Dirk, I think that's a, that's a perfect place for us to end today's conversation. <clears throat> Thank you for being so open and honest and sharing your journey and your client's stories and how you see the future and i wish you all the best with your practice and making a positive difference in south africa thanks louis and uh, join the cause i know you do thank you all right cheers